understanding. We have two morning sessions in the next two weeks and they're both anatomy. So I think what we'll do is just to make sure everybody's on the same page and make sure we don't get too far behind. We'll schedule Monday for physiology uh, instead of anatomy. And that will get us partially caught up. Probably what we'll do though, and it will be difficult, more difficult for you at the very end, is probably not to switch one of the anatomy and physiology at the end too. Uh, um, see how we stand at that point. But generally we we'll, we'll, We'd we'll generally need one more physiology than, than, that, than anatomy, and this time she scheduled two more anatomies than physiology, so we have a problem. But in any case, Monday will be, uh, that's right on that day, physiology, so we can finish up that first unit and move right on into the discussion of the reproduction. Okay, in our uh, anatomy, we were talking about it, we were discussing the, uh, the uh, lower limb, we were trying to finish up. Uh, the, our discussion of the leg. And we talked, for example, about the, uh, the deep fibular nerve. We talked about the, the localization of the tibial nerve, and we'll, we'll continue that discussion um, as we proceed uh, farther along with the leg. This is a little, little um, video on what is called a coprochial block. I just wanted you maybe to see, understand the importance of some of the anatomy we talked about um, as it is explained here. So as, as we pointed out, they're getting together the raw materials. A lot of these raw materials are available in kit form. Um, we saw that with the spinal tap, for example, when we looked at that procedure. So notice here there's going to be um, something like a, a nerve simulation device. They're going to locate the nerve and then they're going to um, localize it very precisely before adding, before administering the anesthetic by seeing if when they apply a signal, they get a corresponding contraction of the muscle. So that's what all this is about, and basically anesthetic and so on. So let's see if we can follow the general logic of the procedure. Alive to appreciate the muscle twitching generated by the nerve stimulator. The electrode should be placed on the patient's leg to complete the electrical circuit. Ensure that the posterior surface of the patient's leg is well exposed. Both the tibial nerve and common perineal nerve can be accessed from the popliteal fossa. Viewing the internal structures of the popliteal fossa discloses the proximity of the tibial and common perineal nerve slightly above the joint. Identify the landmarks of the fossa. Mark the popliteal crease. Palpate and mark the borders of the popliteal triangle. Flex the knee to mark the biceps femoris tendon laterally and the semimembranosus and semitendinosus tendons medially. Using your ruler, make a mark seven centimeters superior to the popliteal crease along the border of each tendon. Identify the midpoint between the two markings. This will be your point of insertion. Once you have identified the anatomical landmarks, prep the skin starting at your insertion site, proceeding outward. Repeat this step three times. Allow the povidone iodine to dry before proceeding with needle insertion. Put on sterile gloves before proceeding or ask an associate to assist you such that sterility is maintained throughout the remainder of the procedure. After prepping the skin, put on sterile gloves. Using the tuberculin syringe, create a skin wheel with the 1% lidocaine in the cutaneous tissue over the insertion site. Prior to inserting the stimulating needle, use a beveled needle to puncture the skin. The puncture site will allow the blunt tip of the stimulating needle to pass easily through the skin. Turn on the nerve stimulator. Set the dial to generate 1.5 milliamps of current. Holding the needle perpendicular to the skin, insert the needle slowly at the previously marked needle insertion site. As the needle penetrates the skin and subcutaneous tissue, local muscle stimulation may be achieved. If this occurs, gently pull the needle back and redirect it away from the previous path. So you're shooting for the nerve, not the As muscle, the needle is inserted, continue to watch for the
the appropriate muscle stimulation. This includes calf twitching and toe flexion. When appropriate muscle stimulation is achieved, the amplitude of electrical current is decreased. Continue to monitor the muscles for twitching. Maintain nerve stimulation at a current level of 0.2 milliamps to 0.5 milliamps. The proximity of the stimulating needle to the two nerves, as indicated by stimulation at a low level of current, increases the likeliness of an efficacious block. If the nerve stimulation is lost as you decrease the stimulating current, slowly redirect the needle to regain muscle movement. If you have difficulty attaining muscle twitching of the calf and toe flexion, bring the needle back to the skin and redirect it one centimeter laterally. If the needle is located in an overly medial position, the tip will not stimulate the nerve, but will instead be inadvertently directed toward the popliteal artery and vein. Switch to complicated. When muscle twitch is sustained at 0.5 milliamps, it is appropriate to inject anesthetic. Now, Aspirate the syringe to ensure the needle tip is not located within a vascular structure. Inject the anesthetic in divided doses, monitoring the patient for signs of intravascular injection. Warn the patient of signs or symptoms he would experience if the anesthetic were injected into a vessel. Aspirate the syringe after each 5 milliliter dose. Inject a total dose of 40 milliliters of anesthetic. So that's a lot of you, you understand the general theory here. You localize with the, with the stimulation device and then introduce the anesthetic. But again, all of that turns and hinges upon an understanding of the correct anatomy. You saw how the how they had to recognize the uh, popliteal tendons and, and measure it exactly where that uh, particular nerve was, uh, was expected to be. All right, let's move on down and, and, and begin our discussion of the leg in a little more earnest. There's a discussion in this slide <coughs> of the, the membrane systems that um, enshroud and extend through the leg. Now keep in mind that the leg is prone to a, a fairly high um, vascular pressure. Uh, there's a problem with the return of blood uh, back to the heart. We talked about the muscular venous pump. In any case, uh, keep in mind that down here we have a very robust fasciolata. Fasciolata is that encasing cellophane type membrane. Between the two bones of the leg, there's an interosseous membrane. We'll look at that in more detail. And then there are a couple of intermuscular septa that also act to compartmentalize the, the, uh, the uh, various regions of the leg. Now, that's going to be important, as we'll see in another little animation shortly, because this region in particular is prone to uh, problems of potential swelling, inflammation, blood flow, and so on, because of these septa and very robust encasements. In any case, uh, the leg, instead of having a medial compartment, now has a lateral compartment in addition to the anterior and posterior compartments. Uh, the anterior compartment is primarily for dorsiflexion, and that's the fancy term we use at this point. Dorsiflexion is going to be uh, movement of the toes superiorly. Plantar flexion is going to be probably the more powerful, or certainly the more powerful and more important movement uh, necessary for uh, locomotion. And then we talked about the eversion of the foot. You should be able, at least uh, partially, to, well, you should be able to walk on a slope, right? You can walk on a slope because your ankle has the ability to invert and evert. I think we're familiar with the bones. We've already talked about the important bone markings. For example, we talked about the proximal markings earlier, the uh, ischial tuberosity up here, for example. We talked about the malleoli. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, the malleoli, the, the lateral and the uh, medial malleolus, uh, are going to have a 
collateral or remedial, one is one is going to be on the fibula, the other is going to be on the fibula, but these are these bony projections of the anchor and femur pillow joint. There is a little notch down here in the tibia to accommodate the uh, to accommodate the uh, apposition of the fibula. That's called a fibula notch. And we pointed out earlier that the fibula is lateral, so if you have you're just looking at the knee. We talked about a couple of ways to identify which side of the knee is lateral and which side is medial. Here you can see that interosseous membrane uh, that's, that sort of spans between the tibia and the fibula. This is a uh, robust fibrous membrane that uh, acts to separate the anterior compartment of the leg from the posterior compartment. There are a couple of little apertures. Uh, that allow uh, for uh, for uh, protrusion or extrusion of uh, neurovascular structures, uh, but mostly this is a. Um, I guess if we talk, if we were to discuss the function of the interosseous membrane, I guess we could say that it it lightens the entire mass of the leg, but it also serves as an important uh, locus of the muscle attachment. By the way, before we leave this. Uh, when we talk about the talofural joint or the ankle joint down here, notice the the complexity of that joint. It sort of has a um, horizontal or lateral component and then vertical components as well, limiting the relative movement of the foot. So you can see some of these apertures in the interosseous um, membrane here. Again, the, the anatomically, that interosseous membrane serves to separate the anterior, anterior and posterior compartments. It would be right there. And so this is our anterior compartment here and a relatively large posterior compartment. Now the, the posterior compartment is actually divided into two, two components, a deep and an uh, outer exterior. We won't worry too much about that. Uh, these large muscles back here, the uh, gastrocnemius and the soleus would be our primary concern when we talk a little bit about some of the uh, muscles in the deep, in the deep component. Now we look at the fibrous septa, the singular of which is septum. There are three of them. Together with the interosseous membrane, they divide the muscles of the leg into four compartments, two on the front of the leg and two on the back. We'll look at that first. The renewed gastrocnemius and soleus down to here. Here's soleus divided. Here's the intestine deep fascia divided at the lower level. In front of soleus, this transverse intramuscular septum crosses the back of the leg. It runs from here on the tibia to here on the fibula. Three muscles that we haven't seen yet lie between the transverse septum and the bones. To see the transverse septum better, we'll remove the rest of the soleus. The transverse septum is thin up here, but toward the ankle it becomes thicker. At the ankle, the transverse septum is continuous with the flexor of Now we'll look at the fibrous. At the end. So he's talking about this being the retinacula. And if, if you remember at the beginning when we talked about this, we talked about this entire uh, membrane, this entire encasing membrane, which is called an invest, investing membrane system. And in part, that is because the fascia lava uh, becomes much thicker, uh, at least externally. And then it sort of evolves or, or gradually merges with uh, this retinacula. Uh, there's a uh, flexor and, and a sensor retinaculum that wraps around the ankle region to prevent uh, what is sometimes called bowstringing. Uh, bowstringing would, would imply that in the absence of that uh, aponeurotic encasement, the tendons extending down to the uh, to the foot would break apart, break out of the confinement of the leg. So part of the, part of their function that is to uh, is to ensure that doesn't happen. 
But as we think about that, we think about the anatomy, again, I want you to understand that you saw as he cut away the muscle there, there were several sets of these several um, membranous compartments. These membranous compartments confine the muscle, they confine the blood vessels, they confine the neural structures. And if for any reason there's swelling in this region, that can have, uh, that can have adverse consequences for the patient. So in the illustration here, we're looking at the anterior uh, compartment, actually looking at the nerves, of, the nerves that supply the anterior compartment. The most important of the muscles in the anterior compartment is by far the tibialis anterior. That's that large muscle that runs just adjacent to the, to the shin bone there, the, the anterior tibia. Uh, beside it, um, adjacent to it, is the extensor digitorum. So remember what we're calling dorsiflexion uh, in the wrist would be called extension. So we have, and, and be familiar with the terminology here, we have the extensor digitorum and the extensor hallucis or hallucis. Uh, hallucis refers to the large toe. Uh, in this region, the small toe, you know what it is? The diggity bitty. Isn't that fun to say? So uh, hallucis is the large one. And of course, we're going to have a large tendon that comes down and acts, acts uh, collectively on uh, most of the phalanges. And then there is a relatively small uh, fibularis component, again, paramilis is an alternate term, um, that also acts, even though it's in the anterior compartment, it does, does contribute to somewhat to uh, extension, also contributes to erosion of the anterior foot. All of these anterior compartment muscles are innervated by the deep fibular nerve. So here, remember, the fibula is running down the back, but the common fibula runs off to the side there. Um, more laterally, and then it divides into the superficial. The, su the superficial will innervate the lateral compartment, and then the deep uh, fibula is this one here that uh, predominantly innervates the anterior compartment. As I say, for the most part, most most importantly, the anterior fibula. So we looked at uh, this cross section before. It's a little bit too high for, for it to be very helpful to us, but you can see again the common fibula a very externally exposed in a very uh, lateral position. You should be able to recognize these anterior compartment muscles. Here's the tibialis anterior adjacent to it, is that extensor digitorum. And sometimes you see the you know, in a uh, individuals, sometimes they're not externally evident. Um, and then uh, laterally, way out here, would be the fibularis longus. We'll have a better view of that in just a moment. Now, um, on the medial side of the shin bone there, you may or may not see a division or separation of the gastrocnemius and the soleus, but just remember that the soleus is going to be deep to or uh, anterior to the the two heads of the gastrocnemius. In terms of blood, blood supply, the uh, chief vessels supplying the anterior compartment is the anterior tibial artery, which you can sort of see extending. Uh, sort of running down the uh, adjacent to the fibula uh, and also adjacent to the endohosseous membrane. We will uh, probably not have time to talk too much about this later, but what you should also note as you follow the, uh, the anterior, anterior tibial down is it becomes this, it branches into this network that supplies the dorsal surface of the foot, usually just called the dorsal artery of the foot. Um, <clears throat> and then what will happen, there will be a, there will usually be a super, as in the hand, both a superficial and a deep arch. Um, but all of those are supplied on the dorsal side by the anterior tibia. And you will learn uh, that it's fairly easy to, to palpate or, or detect a pulse in this region just as the, just below the ankle, the top side of the foot, between your first two toes. 
We talked about the lateral compartment, two muscles, most important here, the perineus and fibularis muscles. The longus is the, by far the more prominent of the two. The lateral compartment nerve is the superficial fibular nerve. And for the most part, the blood supply is still the anterior fibula. If you look at our illustration here, here's the fibularis longus there. You can see the tendon extending laterally. And then deep to that, deep to that, just behind it, especially down here, you sort of see it, is the fibularis brevis. Uh, but again, what these muscles do is allow you to sort of uh, evert the foot uh, from a lateral direction. So we indicated a moment ago that by far the most important uh, uh, physiologically anatomically of these compartments is the posterior compartment. This is the plantar flexor compartment, uh, largest, most powerful, and the critical muscles, of course, are the gastrocnemius, not the plantaris, the gastrocnemius and the uh, solus. So here we go, gastrocnemius and solus. Plantaris is a, it's unworthy of our consideration. It's largely a vestigial muscle. It's not even present in some of you. And uh, it isn't terribly important in terms of the, uh, again, the term we use for it is plantar flexion. Plantar flexion is the action that you use whenever you, you start to walk and so on. And then in the deeper compartment, when we looked at the deeper compartment in the uh, Previous, one of the previous illustrations. Here's a popliteus. Uh, that's up there by the knee. That helps to, uh, we talked about this before. It helps to unlock the knee. We talked about the uh, syncope that may occur when the, when the uh, knee is uh, locked. And then notice you have the flexors in the plantar compartment. You have the big toe flexor, and you have the flexors of the other toes as well. And the innervation in the posterior compartment is the tibial nerve. So, two heads of the gastrocnemius out here. Of course, if you pay any attention to just about any athletic and so athletics and soccer, the, the football, the, the soccer, football, the, um, basketball, track, anything, this calcaneal tendon, what's the other term for it? Achilles. Yeah, the Achilles tendon is often. Uh, you often hear the word ruptured or uh, torn or damaged uh, as a consequence of the, the action of these very powerful muscles. And based upon our discussion previously, you might ask yourself, you might be thinking about how could that be repaired given the limited vascularity and the general uh, problems with this tenderness and tenderness and even more so with the nervous tissue uh, being prone to scarring as opposed to repairing. In any case, deep to the gastrocnemius is the soleus here. Um, and then deep to that, again, sometimes called the deep uh, plantar compartment, are the two flexors. The flexor digitorum, more or less uh, medially, and the flexor hallucis, more or less uh, laterally. And we'll come back and talk about some of those, uh, some of those distal connections later, but notice the innovation uh, in both compartments of the tibial nerve. Now, I've been alluding to this earlier, and I don't know how many of you have ever dealt with this. It crops up uh, from time to time in, in, uh, in your favorite crime dramas or your favorite adventure movies or whatever. The uh, hero or heroine or the, uh, the proper terminology in a moment here, will suffer some uh, trauma to the lower to the lower limb. Could be, uh, could actually be in other parts of the body too. We'll look at a, a video in just a moment of where this can occur elsewhere in the body. But the idea is, by virtue of the very, very thick osteomata, this encasing and ducting membrane, and the uh, network of intracompartmental osseal membranes, or stuff that is actually called them, uh, if there is any compression, <clears throat> if there is any swelling, if there is any accumulation of fluid, in some cases even edema can be problematic, <clears throat> the net result is that there can be compression of the neurovasculature. And all of that can potentially lead to loss of blood flow, ischemia, and so on. You can see an individual down here that suffered from what's, what's called compartment syndrome. And what has to be done is that pressure, that building compression has to be relieved. Now, that on all the TV shows that I've seen, what happens when they cut this 
the fuse up. And I know that it has to be true because I saw it on prime time television. Um, have any of you suffered from this? Well, my ex boyfriend had this. I did. I don't remember what it was, but my ex boyfriend had it. He had a refrigerator full of drinking cans. They come right down the side of the fence and they start to move in with him. Yeah, exactly right. That, that, that's often what you see. There was a nursing student a few years ago. Uh, she, I guess she, I think she said that she had run track, run track in her high school and college. She had like four or five incisions on yeah. her leg. So, you know, so I, my guess is that by virtue of her very powerful leg, probably probably genetic components too, uh, there was a disposition to that uh, condition. In any case, there's a little video here on how this can be handled, how this can be addressed. So it's a fasciotomy that's going to have to be performed here. Can any incision medially or laterally marked to an incision for definitive fracture fixation will help avoid any soft tissue complications secondary to skin rigid? By the way, I think in this case there was some type of internal trauma. I think it was probably the dislocation or fracture or some, some internal trauma that, that, uh, that culminated in the compartment syndrome. That's not always the case. Yeah. The distal and proximal fibula are then marked and connected with a straight line. This incision is more posterior than the intramuscular septum between the anterior and lateral compartments, but allows for a healthy skin bridge between the medial and lateral incisions. So the incision is right? roughly one half of the length of the fibula. However, it must be long enough to allow for an adequate decompression. So in other words, there's no point in making a short incision because it may not be. The skin incision is made and then incised down to the fascia. anterior full thickness flap is raised. The fascia is then readily identified. We have the cutting cumbers, the muscle, and any compressed structures underlying them. A transverse fascial incision is made across what is the suspected intramuscular septum between the anterior and lateral compartments. Suspected isn't very really helpful when it comes. The hemostat is then used to probe the intermuscular septum. The foot is then plantar flexed and dorsiflexed, followed by inversion eversion. This confirms the anterior and lateral compartments. The fascia of the lateral anterior compartments are then incised with care to keep the scissors aiming away from the intramuscular septum to avoid superficial perineal nerve damage. Full release of the fascia is carried out. So again, you, you understand what it means by full release. Because if you cut in anything, it appears to be, a, to be an atherosis, proximal incision. Upon releasing all four sections, the viability of the muscle is then checked. The lateral fasciotomy is now complete. Why would he do that? Let's say a person, let's say your patient had come to you, and maybe, as we're going to see in a moment, they waited too long. Um, what would be the purpose of applying the stimulation to the muscle? Yeah, see if it still see if it still functions. Does it have not suffered a reversible necrosis or some other adverse uh, you know, loss of function to the, to the vast tissue? An alternative technique is to identify the superficial perineal nerve at the area of the intermuscular septum to confirm the septum between the anterior and lateral compartments. The superficial and deep posterior compartments can be Access via a medial incision and so they just keep care of taking for the you can, you can see the origin. I just wanted you to understand that uh, even in a fairly gross anatomical procedure uh, such as this, uh, one needs to be very, very certain of the underlying anatomy. After adequate hemostasis, a scanning external fissure is applied for unstable fractures in conjunction with vacuum assisted closure yeah, so it's immediately in line. Fracture, yeah. Now, in this case, have any of you ever heard of miles of hemp? Did he cut the tibialis anteriores? That's the one that he cut. 
through the well, they, in this particular in that particular procedure, they cut on both sides. They cut they cut oh. they freed up the uh, that's why I skipped it. I cut the the piece. They freed up the anterior which sort of the anterolateral compartment, and they turned it over into the posterior compartment too. Uh, I don't know if that's always necessary, but I think in this case because there was so much anterior damage and bleeding, uh, it was it was necessary. Uh, anybody familiar with yeah, I think he's uh, NPR PBS, uh, the, the correspondent Miles O'Brien. He uh, he's still working, but uh, and this this is actually an upper limb, but this is the sort of thing that you might encounter, and why this is an important thing. He was actually in one of these foreign sojourns, reporting I think in uh, Indonesia or wherever he was at the time, and uh, suffered a minor accident or something that fell on his arm, but it had uh, had uh, tragic consequences. Veteran TV reporter who became news himself after a freak accident while out covering a story. It's Miles O'Brien. He is opening up now about the injury that cost him part of his arm and the silver lining that he's now finding. ABC's Lindsay Janice is here with more. Lindsay, good morning. Good morning, Dan. Yeah, this is incredible. It happened just three weeks ago, but Miles O'Brien already back on PBS sharing his story about what was a bruise became an emergency that could have killed him. By the way, before we get into the details of something you, as a PA, might also encounter, it, it, it seems maybe perhaps seems irrational to you, but I can certainly understand it. You've already seen that he lost his arm. He went into denial. He just re he refused to, <clears throat> first of all, accept the, the magnitude or the seriousness of the injury. That was part of the problem. But then, even after his arm was uh, uh, removed, amputated, he didn't tell anybody. He refused to accept it and tried to try to go on with his life for no, you know, otherwise normal. So this is something that you too, I think, would have to deal with. Award-winning journalist Miles O'Brien is speaking out for the first time since a freak accident cost him his left arm. It's not something I would uh, wish on anybody. He had just finished filming a story on Japan's infamous Fukushima nuclear plant and was on his next assignment in the Philippines tweeting this photo of himself getting a haircut in Manila. Just days later, a case carrying heavy camera equipment fell on his arm. It hurt, but O'Brien didn't even consider medical attention until days later, telling PBS NewsHour host Judy Woodruff about the moment he realized he was in trouble. It began as a bruise, and it just got a lot worse after about a day or so, and uh, the pain got worse. He says doctors knew immediately what they were dealing with, acute compartment syndrome. I had literally had to wiki it with my phone because I had never heard of compartment syndrome. The muscles and vein doesn't expand. And if there's some sort of inflammation or something that, that causes swelling inside there, the pressure builds and there's no place for the blood to go. When an emergency operation went bad, doctors say the only option was partial amputation. They told me going in, though, that, you know, if things don't go well, you might lose your arm. O'Brien describing the excruciating aftermath. It's interesting. The pain when you lose a limb is in what's absent. I feel my hand in a way more acutely than I ever did when I had it. It's clenched up. It's like it's in a vice, practically. At times, it can be extremely painful. And what got him through? I love what Winston Churchill said. You know, if you're going through hell, just keep going. Well, next. So what got the your last one? That's how I get these things. Sodium, just a, a, I think, a, a sort of a clinical pearl that you need to keep in mind as you talk about the, the pressures and the adjusting membranes of the lower of the lower limb. All right, so continuing our discussion, we've already indicated we're talking about the posterior compartment, these very power, powerful flexors, the blood supply for the, the uh, flexor compartment, plantar flexor compartment, is the posterior tibial artery. Um, you can see that the posterior tibial sort of yields a branch up here uh, that is the fibula. You can sort of see the fibula there. And then there's also a, an anterior tibial. So uh, this is going to supply, of course, the anterior compartment. And then this sort of, this sort of part of the, uh, uh, the branch here, the fibula, sort of supplies both the uh, lateral and anterior compartments. Just as you will learn to, uh, in fact, I can, I can readily see both pulses uh, looking at the foot because of blood pressure. Uh, you will learn that uh, you can easily uh, detect or discern pulse 
on the dorsal foot between the between the large toe and the second toe, uh, between the between the medial medial uh, malleolus and your Achilles tendon. Uh, my guess is, if you go over the night, you'll see a you'll see a large artery pulsing there too. If not, it's uh, fairly easy to, to get that uh, to detect the pulse there. But in any case, that's the posterior uh, tibial pulse. We'll talk about some of the structures that pass along that path a little later. In this section, we won't follow the deep veins any further, since their course is just the same as that of the corresponding arteries. We'll look at the arteries next. The three main arteries which supply the leg and ankle region are all branches of the popliteal artery. They're the anterior tibial, the posterior tibial, and the perineal. In the dissection that we'll see, all the veins have been removed to simplify the picture. Here's the popliteal artery, passing between the two heads of gastrocnemius. It branches to gastrocnemius have been removed. To follow the popliteal artery, we'll remove gastrocnemius. The popliteal artery runs down the back of the popliteus muscle, then passes through the fibrous arch in the origin of soleus to remove soleus. At the lower border of the popliteus muscle, the popliteal artery gives off this major branch, the anterior tibial artery, which runs forwards. We'll follow it in a minute. The popliteal artery then ends by dividing into the perineal artery and the posterior tibial artery. We'll follow the posterior tibial artery first. It runs down the back. By the way, notice the beautiful, this is almost an idealized specimen, but these idealized perforating arteries that uh, uh, extend across the compartment stone. Back of the leg, just behind the deep posterior muscle. It's covered by the increasingly thick transverse intramuscular septum, which we'll remove. As it passes toward the medial side of the ankle, the posterior tibial artery lies just behind tibialis posterior. At the ankle, the artery passes through a tunnel beneath the sector retinaculum, part of which has been removed here. Within its tunnel, the posterior tibial artery divides into the medial plantar and lateral plantar arteries, which will follow in the next section. In the Um, lateral plantar arteries up. The um, I just wanted to make sure you understood that, that posterior circulation, and this is generally true for most of those arteries, uh, that posterior circulation then continues down the back a couple of parts of tunnels here, one's called the parcel tunnel, we'll come to in just a moment. But those vessels then supply predominantly the plantar surface of the foot. We talked about the head up the dorsal and dorsalis pedis earlier. So again, um, the fibular artery there, posterior tibial, uh, medial there. We've also talked extensively about the fibular nerve. The fibular nerve, remember, is a continuation of the popliteal nerve, which is then a continuation of the, of the, uh, the, the large nerve on the thigh, the, the sciatic nerve. And the tibial nerve then is going to and continue down, uh, and we, we've already pointed out that the it will give usually give rise to another branch, and it can happen at the knee, it can happen down here somewhere. That will also mix or join with a branch of the fibular nerve, and together they will form that the sural nerve. And the sural nerve you will see sort of descends initially uh, medially. But it's going to be important to you because it basically provides cutaneous um, lateral innervation to the foot, usually along this region down in here. All right, with that in mind, we're down to the foot. Let's quickly talk about the, uh, the bones of the foot. We generally define the foot separate the bones of the foot into two large compartments, the hind foot, the midfoot, and the forefoot. The hind foot here consists of two bones, uh, the talus and the calcaneus. You can see the talus on top here, the calcaneus would be inferior to that. 
two very large, powerful muscles that are sometimes not muscles, bones that are sometimes prone to uh, to loss of blood flow. And then in the midfoot, you have the um, the bones that you see here: the cuboid, the navicular, and the three cuneiforms. Um, the navicular is the more medial of the two. The cuboid is over here. And then if you step to the uh, cuneiforms, you have a medial. Uh, and then a lateral over here as well, and then the medial cuneiform. And then anterior, in the forefoot, of course, you have the metatarsals and the phalanges. And notice the number that they would be in the hand. And there are several illustrations pointing out that this is the anymore under those bones here. But be sure you can, for example, again, differentiate the navicular from the cuboid and the orientation of the cuneiforms. Let's we'll come back in a moment and talk about these joints. Notice the uh, metatarsals have both a head and a base. So in the discussion of the joints of the foot, we sometimes make reference to the, the uh, head attachment or the base attachment. And the phalanges, there for each of the toes, there are there are uh, three bones that make up the phalanges with the exception of the big toe, but they join a T. So the, each phalanx is going to have a base, a shaft, and a head, um, with the exception of the large toe of the phalanx. Now the scene of visual procedure like this, one of the uh, one of the ladies in the uh, program just went through this to see if we can figure out what they're doing. Oh. <laughs> Notice the tool they're using to perform this procedure. <laughs> right. Some of this inspires confidence. Oops. Oh. <laughs> that was a yeah. <laughs> Could have been worse. Just <laughs> maybe. Says, ooh, look at that. Please don't look at that. Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your patient, please. <laughs> All right, so we're looking at these tendons, and we, we, we talked about the bones of the foot. Of course, we've talked about the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the foot. So you have um, most of the flexors and extensors, uh, dorsiflexors and plantar flexors uh, that exert very powerful, uh, very powerful forces on the bones of the foot. And as they do so, we have these, these uh, tendinous encasements. Um, these are sometimes called uh, synovial sheaths, and they basically act like bushings. Tendinous sheaths, bushings. their Latin term being vagina typosa tendinous, are sliding tubes that allow the tendons themselves to move smoothly and without friction. A small fissure contains a fluid that helps the layers move smoothly against each other. And this is going to be true for both the uh, foot and the hand, and, and the, certainly the hand is the tendon that she's become quite, uh, quite complex. But that's the idea here. It's sort of an, it, you, you have these in all kinds of uh, cables in your car where you have a cable, for example, for your accelerator. And sometimes if you don't have hydraulic uh, clutches and so on, you have these cables running through achieved like this. So mechanically, it's a very simple principle, uh, but they will, they will include uh, several tunicas in here, several layers, and then some type of lubricating fluid to ensure that everything is, uh, that, the, that the tendon moves, uh, moves easily within that, uh, within that chamber. Any of you ever suffered from plantar uh, fasciitis? What is it like? Thank you. That's horrible. <laughs> Um, well, so 
there were exams on Monday morning. So how would you differentiate? Um, well, it's a persistent pain as soon as. Now, at first, it started with the pain in the morning when I would get up, and uh, it wasn't discovered by my primary. So it continued to get worse and worse, and then I pretty much couldn't walk. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so that's unusual. Um, the old, the, the athletic result that you hear in the locker room is that the fasciitis takes a year to get going and a year to resolve. Was, was it very long term for you? Did it take a long time to, to correct? Yes, I, I tried to avoid surgery as much as possible. So I tried to do all kinds of the injections. I think oh, really? I had five in my heel and each time it would just uh, get it would stop working sooner and then I uh, ended up having the um, the ultrasound uh, therapy and mm -hmm. that actually helped me so I've been without a problem of my heel right now I can I can actually start I'm getting back to jogging now which is fantastic and it took me about two and a half years so yeah, I mean that's that's yeah. very typical. Um, you know what caused it? And just getting a spur and a spur. Okay, that's yeah. what, that's what I thought yeah. you were going to say. Now, don't think. I think what you're talking about is a bone spur then in the heel. Is that what you're talking? About? No, no. This, but the spur spur started causing the fasciitis. Oh, so yeah. you, you had some sort of aggravated condition. Yeah. Because normally, in fact, has anybody else had the fasciitis? Where do you normally feel the pain? In your, like where would the, the fasciitis? Yeah, sort of in a mid region here because uh, you probably had a more complex yeah. complex issue and it is it seems to be associated with athletic endeavors athletic uh, exertion that <clears throat> and we have to be careful here because the, not all uh, not all authorities use the same terminology um it's the, the condition is called fasciitis inflammation or <laughs> swelling of the fascia but in effect this is a this is an atherosclerosis and it's a superficial atherosclerosis that eventually culminates distally into these little tendinous cha channels uh, that, that we have time we'll look at uh, later. But I just want you to understand as we, before we take a break, this is an exceedingly superficial structure that is not, uh, these are not uh, the ligaments and these are not the tendons. This is right there just under the surface of the skin. Is it chronic pain? I would say so. It may be type of movement, certainly. I mean, I've had, uh, I had a little, I had it years ago, and then it just sort of resolved. I get after about two years. Um, but then you had the spur. And that, I know that's always been that sort of spur. But I would say yes. I know. Uh, oftentimes, these things come in constellations. For example, I was. Uh, any of you ever use the electrical machines? Anybody ever notice a problem with those? Not going the right way. <laughs> those those tendons that run along the ankle, they just braid it over and over and over again. And sometimes that can cause that can induce pain or even cause numbness. And sometimes the same things that can cause that type of uh, phenomenon can also exacerbate or give rise to the fasciitis. All right, let's take a break and we'll resume that.